I'm Jack Parker. I practice pulmonary and critical care medicine at West Virginia University. It's my pleasure to teach young physicians and care for patients. And I also have a longstanding interest in the imaging of occupational lung disease and the recognition and prevention of occupational uh, lung disease. Uh, many of my mentors through the years are in this room, and I would like to uh, thank them for all that they uh, taught and shared with me through the years. Um, I also, as I was preparing this uh, presentation on chest imaging and dust diseases, uh, to talk about the differential diagnosis of especially upper zone uh, radiographic abnormalities, um, uh, large lesions on chest x-rays, what is usually PMF in dust exposed workers, I found myself reflecting on why I was invited to speak. And I'm, I'm going to come back to that in, in just a moment. But my objectives or goals are to review some of the structures on normal chest x-rays. I realize that not the whole audience is physicians, and the audience that is uh, in the medical field may know as much or more about radiography than I do. I also want to demonstrate some of the patterns that happen on chest x-rays when people are exposed to dust, especially what may happen in the upper zones. I want to talk a little bit about why old films are important because you can see uh, change over time, uh, response to therapy, uh, lots of findings that may give you insight into why somebody's radiograph is abnormal. But I'm actually here because of greed, of all things. Uh, yeah, I think you did hear me right. I'm here because of greed. Uh, I'm embarrassed that I'm here because of greed. I'm disheartened that I'm here because of greed. I'm uh, saddened that I'm here because of greed. And despite what we may have heard in uh, movie lines and movie themes spoken by actors, uh, greed is not good. I'm also here because scientific and intellectual honesty uh, is important and critical in the search for truth. It's very important to society, and it's very important to individuals that professionals uh, be intellectually and scientifically honest as they seek the truth and try to remove uh, bias that may be adverse to seeking the truth. I'm also here because uh, of the work of uh, a journalist. I'm here in many ways because of the power of the pen uh, it's not only Congress, it's not only the executive branch, it's not only the judicial branch, it's not only the public and citizenry, but it's sometimes uh, journalists who can help us uh, elevate a discussion or begin an old discussion that needs to be talked about anew. So the uh, 2014 Pulitzer Prize recognized journalist named Chris Hamby is probably the real reason I'm here today. So. This is Stonehenge. Uh, thousands of years ago, uh, uh, civilizations were casting shadows that were important to them. And I would suggest that a chest x-ray is nothing other than a special way to look at shadows. And it's an important tool for evaluating pulmonary diseases. And it started off primarily to recognize infectious diseases. And it grew into having its important in COPD, interstitial lung disease, uh, cancer, and of course the occupational lung diseases. So it's been important uh, for public health and individual health uh, for many years and for many reasons. That backup alarm on the emergency equipment in that room is, uh, is not to be mistaken for a, a fire alarm, so we don't have to leave. This is a normal chest x-ray. I'm going to project it several times just to kind of imprint our minds on what normal looks like. Notice that the costophrenic angles are nice and sharp, the lung fields are dark and air-filled, the bones appear white, and the heart appears white. But the lungs, because they're primarily full of air and blood vessels and fine, lacy, delicate alveoli, appear dark. This is a histology of the spongy gas exchange region of the lung, and notice that uh, these fine, lacy, delicate, doily-like structures is the meat of the matter or the heart of the matter or the, where the rubber meets the road for gas exchange and that the air spaces kind of out 
strip in volume the amount of tissue that's there. And so air on a chest x-ray looks dark and tissue and other structures look white. So I'm often asked how to look at a chest x-ray uh, by physicians in training and by others. And I think it's important to uh, look at lots of x-rays in order to be able to recognize not only normal structures but abnormal structures. And it's also critical to see many x-rays so that you can use some pattern recognition response of the neuroscience of the brain, uh, but then also to have a thorough review of what the normal structures might be. So I like to sometimes say if we were walking on the African savanna 5,000 years ago, we would be able to pick out the limping zebra in the herd of zebra. And if you didn't pick out the limping zebra, you were probably going to miss lunch and dinner. A chest x-ray. So labeling the air-filled trachea, labeling the clavicle, labeling posterior ribs, recognizing anterior ribs, the diaphragm, the cardiac silhouette, the aortic arch, and then the dark air-filled lung with some blood vessels running through it. So although a chest X-ray may be abnormal, it doesn't always tell us immediately and with certainty what the abnormality is. The abnormality uh, that we see is actually presents what we would call a differential diagnosis because the lung has a limited number of ways of responding to an injury, an inhalational injury, and the shadows from inhaling mycobacterial tuberculosis or tuberculosis organism and the body's response to it may sometimes cause a pattern not dissimilar, to use the classic medical phrase, from pneumoconiosis. But we have hints on the x-rays as to what the shadows might represent. We also typically need clinical history, findings, physical exam, lab data, important histories of exposure to even better understand what's on the x-ray. So the x-ray is just one piece of the, uh, the data that we might use to understand what's wrong with somebody. And I would again emphasize, just as Dr. Rasmussen and Akshay Sood emphasized the importance of a blood gas or oximetry right as exercise is terminated, not 30 seconds later, not 90 seconds later, uh, that the value of an old film in understanding the evolution or lack of change on a chest or x-ray uh, can be very helpful or important. Also, even though we have uh, chest x-rays, CT scanning can supplement or complement our understanding and recognition of what's on plain films of the chest. Let me provide a quick example, not something in the parenchyma lung, but something in the mediastinum that presents a differential diagnosis. So on this chest x-ray, screen right, the abnormality is not in the spongy air-filled gas exchange region of the lung, but most of the abnormality is surrounding the heart with these great big blood vessels and paratracheal lymph nodes. And this, these shadows provide a differential diagnostic consideration for the clinician. Similarly, uh, on screen, screen right, this being screen left, sorry, there also is too much uh, whiteness around the heart on this x-ray. And one turns out pathologically to represent sarcoidosis, this one, and one zip ends up representing lymphoma. So they're similar. They have characteristics that may suggest one disorder versus the other, but sometimes the diagnosis depends upon other laboratory data, history, physical exam, even pathologic tissue biopsy at times. So lung injury patterns are complex, and again, they don't always take you to a single diagnosis, but I would submit just as this uh, baboon sitting much like Rodin's The Thinker that... Uh, we improve our clinical and even humanistic skills by thinking rather than just reacting. Here's an x-ray. Does anyone in the audience think the abnormality is on this side, which is the patient's left, or this side, which is the patient's right? Where is there too much white? On that side. Yeah. So now you can all be radiologists. This is a, a shadow that shouldn't be here. And probably represents a pneumonia, has characteristics that would make you think of pneumonia. 
But if this was occurring in somebody who didn't have cough, fever, chills, you wouldn't be thinking of acute pneumonia trying to come up with another explanation for the abnormality. Okay, is the abnormality on this side or side two? Side one or side two? Side two. Man, just just think of the knowledge you already have to classify these images. So this would be typical of a, an acute infiltrate, somebody who may also have a pneumonia happens to be on the left side. But again, in the right clinical setting, maybe this wouldn't be pneumonia, maybe another diagnosis. Oops. Okay. This image, notice how instead of being able to point to one side and saying, is it worse, and the other side and asking if it's worse, I think it's relatively symmetrical. So the abnormalities are relatively symmetrical. And we'll see how that's quite common in pneumoconiosis, to have relative symmetry. The dust that's inhaled tends to injure both sides relatively equally with some differences that actually relate eventually to physiology and pathobiology. So this would be quite characteristic of somebody with progressive massive fibrosis lesions in the right upper zone and left upper zone on a background of high perfusions, small opacity uh, abnormalities. I don't see any abnormality on either side, and they're dark and air-filled and relatively symmetrical. So I think we would all assume this is either a normal film or only, at worst, a mildly abnormal film. This film, however, has more whiteness, but it's relatively symmetrical and would be quite typical of high perfusion uh, co-workers pneumoconiosis or silicosis with the absence of PMF lesions, the absence of large opacities. So again, pneumoconiosis is relatively symmetrical comparing the right and left side, but there's often asymmetry between the apex and the base. In silica and coal exposure, the abnormalities tend to be more in the upper zones that relate to deposition and clearance of dust. PMF lesions uh, are often necessary to be extinct, uh, distinguished from infection and neoplasm, and infection and cancer are often much less symmetrical than the findings of uh, pneumoconiosis. PMF lesions typically start in the right upper zone, then they may appear in the left upper zone, and in addition to the upper zone on the chest x-ray, they're also in a very special location called the superior segment of the lower zone, also called by these letters and numbers B6. And B6 on a PA radiograph makes it appear as if it's kind of in the mid-zone. But PMF lesions can happen in all zones. They just, on a statistical basis, seem to be more common in the upper zones and often begin in the right upper zone. Again, a diagnosis should never be based solely on a radiograph. It's a combination of imaging and clinical information and time course of the disorder and response to therapies of the disorder, et cetera. Uh, although the radiograph plays a seminal role, it's not the only thing that a diagnosis should be based upon. So these differential considerations for progressive massive fibrosis, we mentioned it includes cancer. It may include TB or other chronic infections, some fungal diseases. Granulomatous diseases, such as sarcoidosis, may affect the parenchyma and the adenopathy uh, as well. But again, it's not based solely on the radiograph. It's this combination of time course, response to therapy, and other clinical information. This is a very abnormal radiograph. Happens to be an ILO standard film. Does it look like the abnormalities, which again are too much white in the parenchyma of the lung, does it look relatively symmetrical? Not perfectly symmetrical, but relatively symmetrical? Yes, I think both the right and left side are abnormal, and this is a category C, uh, advanced progressive massive fibrosis or complicated pneumoconiosis. Another example of something that may accompany <coughs> silica-related disease is eggshell calcification. Uh, probably everyone in the audience has heard about it and its relationship to silica. Uh, that at the distance and the lighting in the room, it may be difficult to see that the mediastinal and hyalur nodes have some calcification within them, and the calcium is uh, often in the periphery of the lymph node, so eggshell calcification. 
just a brief pathology of the simple pneumoconioses. Um, this is a trichrome stain. But I like to think of silicosis and, to some degree, co-workers' pneumoconiosis as the body's reaction to a noxious substance or dust. Does anybody own a pearl necklace or a fake pearl necklace? Okay. Where do pearls come from? They come from oysters, right? And so if either artificially a grain of sand is put into the oyster or naturally the grain of sand goes into the oyster, and it doesn't like the irritation. And so it, if it can't cough it out, spit it out, vomit it out, the oyster is going to form a pearly substance around that irritating speck of sand and make it smooth and therefore much less irritating to the tender uh, meaty surfaces inside the clam. And I would suggest in some ways, in simple terms, that's kind of what's happening in pneumoconiosis. The body doesn't like these shards of silica, these uh, noxious uh, coal dust particles, and it tries to wall them off or uh, protect the body from their presence. And I would suggest this is somewhat of a spherical structure that looks round or circular in two dimensions and in some ways is not unlike a pearl. The radiographic manifestation of this lesion are these multiple spherical, circular, in two dimension uh, structures that are uh, pneumoconiotic shadows that are relatively symmetrical but in this case dominate the upper zones more than the lower zones on this film without progressive massive fibrosis. Another uh, <clears throat> micrographic slide that shows not only the silicotic nodule, but one, two, three of them, maybe a fourth one off screen with fine lacy alveoli intervening and some distortion of the alveoli created by the body kind of reacting to the noxious particle and creating a, a spherical structure. Just to reemphasize normal again, <clears throat> you see no uh, silicotic pearls, you see no coal macules, you see no abnormalities in this gas exchange normal alveolar photomicrograph. Well, just as giraffes are specialized and can get, uh, instead of low-hanging fruit, high-hanging uh, goodies, <clears throat> I would suggest that if, if we really understand the dust diseases of the lungs, we really extend our capabilities in many other ways. Okay. For my own disclosure of intellectual and scientific honesty, I know the first time I saw this image, I said to myself, advanced silicosis, advanced co-workers pneumoconiosis. And when a colleague in Japan said, nope, sorry, this is actually sarcoidosis. Uh, the person worked in a bank, had never been inside of a dusty trade operation, and had a biopsy uh, several years ago that showed non-caseating granuloma. So there are mimics. Uh, I would suggest that this is relatively symmetrical, but I don't see a very good background of small opacities. Um, but most importantly, I wouldn't force anybody to use their clinical radiographic acumen only to make this diagnosis. I wouldn't suspect pneumoconiosis in a banker, uh, assuming they didn't have a summer job for many years or they were exposed to dust. All right, so once again, the history of dust exposure and the work history is very important. Common sense isn't bad either, you know? You know, our grandparents, uh, they got by pretty well in the world with some good old common sense. And if the prevalence of dust disease in coal miners is still tragically 5 to 10 percent, 5 to 10 workers in 100 after 25 years of exposure or so are having abnormal radiographs, why on earth would we try to ex suggest that what they really have is sarcoidosis, which is a disorder that occurs about 10 to 20 times per 100,000 adults, right? Um, you know, someone may have that needle in the haystack and have sarcoidosis, but not silicosis or co-workers pneumoconiosis. But let's base it pretty carefully on uh, common sense, other information, and not quickly discard it as the inconvenience of pneumoconiosis and the non-compensable sarcoidosis. Or let's live in a society where you compensate people in some way that get both diseases. You don't have to decide which one it is. All right. Here's another shadow in the right upper zone. 
that is not pneumoconiosis, but I couldn't resist showing a, a normal finding called an azagous lobe or an azagous vein or an azagous pleural related structure. So it's a comma like sign in the right upper zone. <laughs> Happens about three per hundred three per thousand people. Extraportal fat is commonly seen on x-rays now. It's not a mimic for pneumoconiosis, but it's a pretty good mimic for pleural-related uh, uh, asbestos disease, and it's the deposition of fat in the extrapleural fa- space, and it has some very typical characteristics and tends to be bilateral, and certainly a CT scan can see the difference in density. All right. So chest radiographs, again, have been a very important tool for the screening and surveillance of dust-exposed workers. It's where we develop dust-response relationships. It's part of the science by which NIOSH recommended reducing the coal mine uh, exposure in the U.S. from 2 milligrams per cubic meter to a little less than 1 milligram per cubic meter to reduce the uh, likelihood of developing pneumoconiosis. And chest x-rays were a really important tool in those exposure response relationship works, along with uh, an estimate of uh, uh, lifetime dust accumulation. And again, disappointingly, x-rays also only document failures of dust control. Uh, I'd rather be finding no disease with good dust control than documenting failure of dust control. But it's an imperfect tool, and as I as we keep saying, it doesn't always tell us the exact etiology of the observed findings because the lung just has a certain number of ways of responding to dust. Okay, even in the back of the room, this film looked to be normal or abnormal? I like the response abnormal. Does it look like it's relatively symmetrically abnormal? Right and left? Relatively symmetrical. Look like there's more abnormality in the upper zones than lower zones? Yes. So you just identified the 33RR ILO standard film, typical of, uh, of pneumoconiosis. Large opacities. So this is a cartoon directly out of the ILO written guidelines, reminding us that large opacities can be of A size, B size, or C size, and even on the cartoon showing some characteristic locations in the upper zone, in the mid zone, and again in the mid zone. So superior segment of the lower lobe and the anterior seg- or the posterior segment of the upper lobe, common locations. This uh, African buck was kind of unhappy that I was looking at uh, him, but if you're suspicious, take another good hard look. And here's a film that's abnormal. Um, is there a large opacity that people see on this film? And if so, is it on the page on the right or the left? It's the right, so it's right there. I couldn't with certainty say whether this was a cancer or a tuberculoma uh, or a PMF lesion, but if I saw this lesion on a series of films or saw this lesion with information from the clinician or dust exposure or had no symptoms suggesting cough, fever, weight loss to think of TB, Uh, we might feel quite comfortable eventually calling that PMF. Similarly, oops, I kind of dashed by the B-size opacity. Both sides are abnormal, relatively symmetrical. This PMF lesion is more elongated. This one's a little more uh, triangular or wing-shaped, but they both represent the body's reaction to uh, coal and silica-containing workplace dust and and our progressive massive fibrosis. And this is, again, one of the most advanced cases. The ILO uses this as category C pneumoconiosis with extensive uh, bilateral large opacities, even some uh, at the extremes of the upper zone. And there also is eggshell calcification, if you could see the film up close and carefully. That would be telling us that a fair amount of this exposure was related to silica-containing dust. Little transition slide. If, I, if my clock is correct, we have about 20 minutes. Uh, so a little more entertainment for 20 minutes. Again, primarily looking at images just to give you some confidence to point out as well, though, some pitfalls and other symbols. So the ILO classification system has this cartoon in the back of the book, uh, which is 
page one of two pages of other symbols. And the other symbols uh, have two-letter designations. There's a list that defines what these two letters are and matches it up in English words with the, with the definition. And here's page two, whoops, and here's of the ILO classification system as well. All right, a scene many of us have seen before. Nice fall scene near a river. So the pneumoconiosis can lead to complications, and sometimes these complications present findings on the x-ray related to pneumoconiosis, but sometimes related to pneumoconiosis altering the host's response to infection and barotrauma uh, or causing bleeding. And I just wanted to show some examples of, of those findings on radiographs as well. So we know about chronic bronchitis and melanoptosis. Uh, we know and we'll now see something about pneumothorax and pleural thickening. And uh, it's of course now recognized that minors don't only get traditional findings, but they may have forms of interstitial pneumonitis or pneumonia on their radiographs as well. Yes. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, sometimes when we cough, we cough up phlegm that's clear. Sometimes we cough up phlegm that's white. Sometimes we cough up phlegm that's a little yellow or green. Sometimes we cough up phlegm and it has blood in it or flecks of blood, looks a little red. And sometimes we may cough up um, phlegm that looks very black. And so black is uh, referred to as melanoptosis. Some minors are coughing up black at the end of every shift, but this melanoptosis is a specific symptom that happens when you have a PMF lesion that cavitates, breaks down, liquefies, and then you cough it up as a black sooty form of sputum. Thank you for asking for that clarification. <laughs> so again, <clears throat> because of pneumoconiosis, some people are uh, prone to more infection and get it. Some people are prone to a variety of different uh, immunological or autoimmune diseases and may get them. And some people related to the toxicity of their dust may also get uh, cancer. So this, this, uh, these PMF lesions can have a form of becoming necrotic or avascular necrosis or ischemic necrosis as it kind of gr outgrows its blood supply and then the tissue dies. And that's, again, the setting in which these lesions may cavitate or form a cavity or a big hole in them and where a minor might have hemoptysis as well. And we often worry about superinfection of tuberculosis on top of that problem, too. So this is an international case, not one of my U.S. cases. Um, abnormalities on both sides, but very prominent on the right side. And on the CT scan we can see that it's solid in the periphery but somewhat liquefying in the center. And this is someone who had a, a PMF lesion, uh, progressive massive fibrosis, not a cancer, that uh, eventually cavitated because it became ischemic and outgrew its blood supply. And it was aspirated. And this is the needle that was used to aspirate some of that fluid. It was sent off for cytology to make sure it wasn't cancer. It was sent off for culture to make sure it didn't have tuberculosis or nocardia or some other uh, infection within it. Um, and it. And it did not. And so this is an example of what can happen to PMF lesions, a complication of ischemic necrosis. Here's an image. I'm sure we all see abnormality on both sides, somewhat symmetrical. But this one looks like, again, it's cavitating a little bit. And whether this cavity is from ischemic necrosis, tuberculosis, or malignancy is worthy of clinical uh, evaluation. But I would suggest that there se seems very clear to me that the underlying disease, uh, given a history of dust exposure and change over time on the x-ray, is pneumoconiosis. And the tuberculosis that was present here was a complication, not the cause of all the abnormalities, but a complication. So a clinician who's trying to attribute all of this disease to tuberculosis is less likely correct, okay? Uh, there can be the complication of TB, 
but I think you're less likely correct to just attribute all of this to tuberculosis in the proper clinical setting with a history of radiographic change over time. I want to show you another complication that can happen, and that's going to be air between the lung and chest wall on the inside. It's called a pneumothorax, or air within the chest that's outside of the lungs, between the lung and chest wall. It happens in PMF, uh, you know, maybe 10% of the time or so. And <clears throat> there are various symptoms. Someone may have chest pain. They may be profoundly uh, in respiratory distress. Um, and although we call them spontaneous, they're happening as a result of their pneumoconiosis. Relatively symmetrical abnormalities on this imaging. Uh, large opacities, upper zone opacities on both sides, but there's actually air between the edge of the left lung and the chest wall, and there's air between the edge of the left lung and the chest wall there, and there's what we call a deep sulcus sign. So this person had chest pain, shortness of breath, presented acutely to an emergency room, and was managed, um, this is not the same case, but managed with a chest tube. So here's a coronal section of a CT scan. It looks like, much like a PA radiograph, but you don't see anterior and posterior ribs, and there's air between the lung and chest wall, and extensive air in the soft tissue uh, on the right chest and in the mediastinal structures. So this is a very specific finding on a coronal CT scan. This is uh, another example of that man who had the pneumothorax, and this is a chest tube. In Asia, they often have chest tubes that have a little bullet at the end to identify that the chest tube is present. All right. Here's another man who has abnormality on both sides, but notice how it's very dark out here in the periphery. He again presented with chest pain, shortness of breath, and was found on the x-ray to have a pneumothorax and the chest tube partially re-expanded his lung, and over time we would hope it would completely re-expand his lung. But these are very difficult lesions to sometimes uh, manage because of compliance abnormalities in the, in the lung. Another chance to see it on CT scan, this one with a chest tube that's not completely re-expanding the lung, but constant suction and maybe a thoracic surgery procedure would be needed to fix this man's chest. All right. This is not to demonstrate a pneumothorax, but to demonstrate parenchymal abnormalities, large opacities, and the accompanying pleural reaction or change. So many times when there's scarring in the parenchyma of the lung, the uh, pleura also reacts to the fibrosis and scarring. It's stretched, it's inflamed, it's irritated, and it forms a pleural thickening. Um, here's an example of an upper zone lesion with some adjacent pleural abnormality. So I just wanted to remind us that there is pleural thickening, there can be pleural effusions, that they're more complicated with these, they're more common in the complicated pneumoconiosis than they are in simple pneumoconiosis, and many times it's a pleural reaction adjacent to PMF. So if you have uh, someone who's trying to suggest it couldn't possibly be silicosis or co-workers pneumoconiosis. It must be asbestos-related disease because there's a pleural abnormality. Just remember that that is not always a, a truism. Um, pleural disease and silicosis really is quite common, especially in advanced disease. It may involve both pleural surfaces, what's called the visceral and parietal, and it's a result of scarring and fibrosis in the parenchyma and the pleural's response to it as well. How about coughing up blood? We talked about coughing up black soot, melanopsis. You can also cough up blood. We often think of that as a symptom of tuberculosis or cancer, but it can happen when there's bronchitis and bronchiectasis as well. And uh, in complicated pneumoconiosis, there are often multiple collaterals to the PMF lesions and patients may cough up blood as a result of the adjacent bronchiectasis and other torsion and twisting and abnormalities of the airways. And in this case, this is a coronal CT of a worker who had hemoptysis uh, on top of their PMF, 
Notice also the bolus emphysema or traction emphysema that occurs in this individual too. And as a life uh, saving uh, procedure, had an angiogram, and the angiogram is showing uh, not only blood that's in blood vessels, but blood that's extravasating and blood that's causing a blush or blood that's uh, escaping the circulation. And eventually this was embolized therapeutically to make the bleeding stop. How about cancer? I wanted to talk very briefly about PET scanning. You'll hear about people getting PET scans with their workup for lymphoma or their workup for lung cancer or following their breast cancer, their colon cancer. And there is a mimic of cancer uh, that causes an abnormal PET scan, and that is, in fact, PMF. So people that have large opacities, complicated pneumoconiosis, progressive massive fibrosis, um, those PMF lesions are metabolically active and take up the radiographic tracer and cause positive PET scans. They also may have very positive scans uh, in the lymph nodes as well. So the lymphadenopathy uh, that is associated with uh, co-workers pneumoconiosis and silicosis may also avidly take up the, the tracer and may abnormally uh, appear and make people think it's cancer when it's not. This is um, a man also with bilateral disease, upper zone and lower zone involvement, lots of bulbous emphysema, another case showing lots of uh, traction emphysema, waterfall appearance of the blood vessels, and another case that looks uh, like it might make you worry about cancer as well, but turns out to be solely pneumoconiosis. All right, so what's the nectar? What's the, what's the nectar in the talk? What's, the, what's this uh, bee doing on the flower? Well, let's talk just briefly about the other symbols. Uh, in addition to comments on a bee reader form or an ILO classification form, there are these symbols that are preceded by the phrase suggestive of or um, indicative of or suspect. So if a reader checks the cancer box, it doesn't mean there's a cancer for sure. If the reader reads the emphysema spot box, it doesn't mean there's emphysema for sure. It just means there's something about the radiograph that causes the reader to consider um, those other labels or diagnoses. Here's an example of some apical thickening in a, in a worker with dust exposure. There's coalescence of small opacities that can occur. Again, a very abnormal x-ray, high perfusion with coalescence. We've talked about bullae a couple times, people that have big dark shadows as a result of the shrinking lung above retracting and, and damaging the lung below and stretching it, causing bullous change or emphysematous change. And here's another example of an upper zone bullae, uh, not to be confused with a pneumothorax, but a complication of the large opacity. Lung cancer does occur. Here's an example that looks like it's pretty spherical and rounded and doesn't quite have PMF characteristics. and. Uh, should be recorded as a large opacity, but perhaps investigated. Here's another person that has a, a lung cancer here, but you notice the relative asymmetry, that there's much more abnormality on the right than the left. And even though I'm giving you a diagnosis on many of these films, it's not based on only the radiographic imaging appearance. It's based upon more careful evaluation of the individual. I just happen to know from the clinicians that gave me the x-rays or cases that have been my own. I'm going to talk ever so briefly about distortion. Um, in addition to emphysema uh, causing abnormality, the trachea can be pulled out of the midline too. Eggshell calcification. Uh, it was hard to see the eggshell calcification on that plane film, but this is a CT looking at some soft tissue windows or mediastinal windows and see this horseshoe shaped structure here and a truly oval shaped structure there. So these are examples of eggshell calcification where the lymph node instead of being calcified densely throughout 
calcifies around its perimeter, uh, much like an egg uh, shell that's protecting the white and the yolk is calcified around the perimeter. Uh, again, the hilum can be involved. This would be typical of uh, anything causing hilar adenopathy. Another example of a lot of asymmetry. There's no abnormality on this left side. This would be unusual in pneumoconiosis to have no abnormality whatsoever recognized on this side. And it isn't surprising that the clinicians determined this person had tuberculosis. This is a fun shadow. Again, notice how there's nothing but darkness on this side. And this is a, an S, but it's a backwards S. So this is the inverted or reverse golden S sign that represents probably a, a mass in the hilum and collapse of the upper zone, so it's, it's a cancer. The ILO provides some other cartoons showing cavities, showing pneumonia, showing goiter, and showing what's called a hiatal hernia. I'm very aware that I've used medical terms quickly, shown a lot of pictures, um, and I want you to take a little more time look at this one. Uh, I remember being a younger kitten and thinking I must be this mature. Now I, of course, wish I was the more mature dude looking back at the younger kitten. So people can have very abnormal radiographs from their dust exposure. Uh, when the dust exposures are intense uh, and cumulatively high, people may develop complicated pneumoconiosis or progressive massive fibrosis lesions that these shadows per create only a differential diagnostic consideration that rarely is a radiograph what we refer to as pathognomonic or absolutely diagnostic of one condition. And it takes the work of uh, clinicians and uh, sometimes industrial hygienists um, as well as radiologists to come to the correct conclusion as to what the radiograph represents sometimes including the need for a tissue biopsy, but not typically required during life to diagnose pneumoconiosis. Well, I thank you for your attention. I also thank you for your commitment to the recognition and prevention of these diseases. And I do want to also acknowledge uh, the work by the Center for Public Integrity, specifically a kid under 30 years of age who wins a Pulitzer Prize for shining a spotlight on something that needed the light shined on it. Thank you very much.